Mr. Scott is a widely published commentator, author of 10 books, and editor of Otto Scott's Compass. The title that I was given is The War for Western Civilization. And your leader selected that topic. And I think it's very interesting that we have a great deal of trouble finding out what goes on in the world, even at a time when we have more newspapers than any other country, and perhaps because we have more newspapers. To discuss the West without admitting that we shared the first and greatest calamity in the First World War without with overlooking the catastrophe which destroyed a thousand years of effort that lifted Europe from the Middle Ages to the supremacy of the West and faith in itself and all its accumulated treasures cathedrals, palaces, homes, industries, colonies, and global establishment around the world from 1914 to 1918, we destroyed all the efforts that took a thousand years to create in four years. Four years of mindless destruction without precedent in the history of every other suicidal effort except the self-destruction of the Roman Greek Empire, which similarly took a thousand years to create and five to destroy. Now we only have an hour to describe what was done and that's far from a, enough to even begin a full description of the folly that occurred in 1914 to 1918. And we can't compare it to its predecessors except to indicate that it had one. But I could not ignore that there was one and ignore that history, which until 1914 was an example to warn us against a repetition. The warning didn't work. And the passage of time is especially hazardous to politicians because their popularity is apt to decline along with the levels that they had once achieved. One of our big problems, in fact, probably our biggest problem, is that we have no historians. We have a bunch of frauds who claim to be historians, but who are not. Very recently, a magazine did a check on historical groups in universities. And they found one which only had uh, no conservative historian at all and none of the others had more than two, where they had probably about a dozen or so each. And they all agreed with their description of history, with history to the last inch. And those who disagreed were not hired, and if they were hired, they were ignored or discharged because the historian works for the university and the university gets its money from the popularity of its historians and the American way is not to allow disagreements historically speaking those who disagree are ignored and this is a check which involves several hundred of our leading historians. And the passage of time is hazardous to politicians 
because their popularity declines along levels that embarrass their descendants, their families, even their children don't like to hear much about them after a passage of time. And they have managed so far in, this, in the 1900s till now to ignore being disgraced because they all agree with each other. Now, historians, and we know from the example of our presidents, are very seldom, the, pres the presidents are very seldom examined in detail after they get out of office. There's a legend that they leave which the press generally applies and agrees with. So like you have more books about Abraham Lincoln than any other single person in our history. Each saying the same things. I will only mention two from a historical point of view. And they have, both of them so far, managed to escape the consequences of the follies for which they were responsible. I mean Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt, who were mainly responsible for destroying, ruining the West, the whole West, which at one time led the world and now is at the bottom of the opinion of all humanity. They were both responsible and it will not take very long to summarize what the overly educated accomplish in high office because the results of our high education have so far been disastrous. It's really worth reading several times, reading into it a number of times because it was an incredible period, the four years that we're talking about and the eight years or the 12 years rather that followed with Mr. Roosevelt. I think we should realize that we have been fooled by the educational system. It has taken a country that in 100 years in the 1800s made this country the richest in the world. In 100 years we became the richest country in the world. We achieved more in that hundred years without any leaders to speak of. Simply because they were free to invent and to work and to choose their own work and to choose how they did it and to choose the simplest way in each of the puzzles that they had to confront. We created machinery that was simple and quick and efficient, like a typewriter. Now, a typewriter didn't need a, me a mechanic to be hired every time you tried to use it, it like a computer. The computer was much more elaborate. They're very fond of how elaborate it is. It's so elaborate that it only works for a few weeks before it breaks down in some form or another. And it costs money to keep going, and it eats up your copy, <laughs> which the typewriter never did. The typewriter was simple. It, was, it all used one keyboard. They're still using the keyboard, but they use it for magic and for music and everything else you can think of, if you're able to get on top of it, which takes eight years to teach kids how to use them. The sheer incredulity of a newspaper or a, an automobile, just lift up the lid and take a look at that machine. You'll never fix your own car again as long as you live. <laughs> and that's a very simple point. 
If we have now teams to do our engineering, we used to have individuals. We have a whole composition set up. What Wil Wilson managed to do in eight years as president was to destroy a thousand years of effort and triumph and turn it into the mess that we have today. The UN, what a wonderful deal. We were going to put all the people of the world together into one, into one company with all their diversity, with all their arguments, with all their ignorances, with all their prejudices, we were going to put up a single system in the Wilson answer to all the difficulties that got us into World War I. Now, he managed in those eight years to destroy a thousand years of effort and turn it into the present mess, which Mr. Roosevelt continued and expanded. Mr. Roosevelt's brilliance was to choose Stalin over Churchill. <laughs> Can you imagine? And he was allowed to do it and praised for doing it because he was bringing us peace. Well, the murders of World War II exceeded all the murders of all the wars of all previous history, with possibly the exception of the Mongols in the ancient days of the past. We put together originally in this country without leaders, with common men who were not aristocrats, they discovered when we got into North America and were up against savage troops, savage Indians who didn't want to be invaded, didn't want to be conquered, didn't want to go to work for white men. They were very strange. <laughs> and his idea was that it was unjust for white people to rule any other race of people. So therefore he broke up deliberately and was happy to do it. He broke up the colonial world which had been the only method by which civilization had improved through the centuries. It was to take a superior culture would take an inferior culture and teach them superior ways. I mean, Rome did that to England for a number of hundreds of years and was bringing civilization to the English, which is not easy to do because they're very stubborn people. <laughs> it just, it took a very short time to bring that down because the Vikings came along and they had their idea of improving the English too. So the colonial world had its problems, but colonization had made Africa, for instance, a continent which had cities, new cities, so it had paved roads, which had factories, which had medical institutions. They don't have any of these now. Now that they're free, they're proving how good they are and how equal they are by murdering each other. So we were wrong in some of our abolitionist estimations of what the black man was like. We didn't pay any attention to the condition he was in when we found him for a while, but then when we did, we managed to give him jobs, we managed to civilize him, bring him up to European standards. He came, went to Harvard, went to Cambridge, went to Oxford, some of them. But we made a mistake in our estimation of them. Right now they comprise, they provide over 50% of our violent crimes. But we, we say they're, they're coming along. They're only 13% of our people. 
and we're doing very well with them in the movies because they have good acting ability and so forth and they are improving but 50 percent of our violent crimes is an awful lot to pay for their presence and we're too soft to stop that but going beyond that and that's only one instance there are signs of insanity in Mr. Wilson when he was in office. We'll get to that in a few minutes. He gave the same speech in Princeton for countless years and maybe longer. And the idea was spread fairly quickly that he was a genius because he was very persuasive and he used very elegant language and had a true talent for speaking. He was one of the first of our professional historians and he was greatly admired by the others in his field because he said things that they already believed. He was not particularly pleasant about what he thought of other races of people. He thought the Scotch, of which he was one, were the smartest in the world and he was I think a little bit off on that because the English had defeated them rather thoroughly and I would say that the guy that wins the fight generally speaking is smarter than the fellow that loses it but the signs of his disability began to appear about the time that World War I started and he was very anxious to get into it because he felt it was not being properly led and he wanted to lead it and he had the richest country in the world at a time when Europe was running short of money and very competitive with all its various elements and he also had the idea that no race should rule another race he felt that was unjust no matter what their conditions were or how they were managed and Europe after all had become very successful more successful than any other civilization in the history of the world so he began to issue pronouncements about the way the war was being conducted and it was con being conducted very badly they had developed weapons which were really murderous and they were using them and they were using them all the way without any respect for anything else and so things were in bad shape and it was very difficult to get the newspapers to make sense out of it which they seldom want to do anyway they want to really keep readers and they want to say things that are exciting and I remember at one time I had some friends of mine from school and I didn't go too far in school because I was more sensible than that but uh, I did ask them at one point in, in a beer hall what they thought would happen when Mr. Hitler finished his attempt to destroy Britain entirely and the bombs were being dropped on London and we sat on our hands doing nothing because Mr. Roosevelt really was not fond of Mr. Churchill and for trivial reasons and the United States was not too fond of England at that time and we were not going to cry in our tears if it was destroyed but it was the only anti-Hitler effort underway they were alone they don't talk too much about that and we don't talk at all about it we were hit by Japan after he had been coaxed into doing something and it was a much harder hit than we expected and it was at that time that Mr. Roosevelt decided that the way out was to get together with Stalin because Hitler had also hit Stalin 
And that was a great surprise to the communist movement because they thought that uh, Stalin was too noble to become a partner with Russia. Well, once you look at the size of the calamity that was underway in 1917, we went to war because Mr. Roosevelt or Mr. Wilson couldn't stay out of it. He wanted to lead the war from his experience as a professor, which he thought was sufficient. So we entered the war because we had been hit by some submarines after the Louisitania had been destroyed by a submarine something like two years later. So at that point he decided that it was sufficient to get us into the war. And we will not discuss the details of the war because they're ghastly. Ghastly. Absolutely suicidal. And all the colonies that England had were used in the fighting, which ended the black respect for the whites because we had been teaching them peace and brotherhood and we were then involved in this fratricidal war. And they said, the whites don't tell the truth. They don't even tell the truth about their gods, their religion. And from there on, things went in a very bad way. But in any event, <clears throat> Mr. Roosevelt, Mr. Wilson had an enormous reputation as a great scholar, a great speaker, as a great person, as a romantic man and a religious man. The fact that he had a, a mistress or so uh, was overlooked, was never mentioned. He was the epitome of the decent and the innocent. But he began to change the nature of the United States at the same time. He helped reduce the Senate from our equivalent of the House of Lords to another House of Representatives which represents the people. And that was considered a great step toward democracy, and democracy was a word which he held very high. Now the founders had looked at democracy. They looked at every republic that was created. And they turned it down because they found that in every instance where a democracy was established, it ended in a despotism by the people. Without exception. The longest states, the longest countries, were the representatives, the ones that had votes. But they were very careful about the votes. One had a secret government, so there were no votes at all. Nobody knew who was running the show because they found that every time popularity came into the situation, the issue was corrupted by the means to achieve popularity. So therefore, to have a secret government and a limited government accomplished everything that was needed. The president went to Paris in order to settle the peace and in order to uh, tell everybody how to do it. And he represented the power in the war because this was the only country which had money. We were still on the gold standard and we had gold and we had more gold than anybody else. And he had inherited this great treasure which he was changing. He was changing the rules. We got rid of the Senate, and we have now the House of Mirth, or I guess they call it, where they can't even read books. They have staffs that read to them and tell them what the books mean and what, what the votes are supposed to be about. <clears throat> 
And we made, during the war, the most effective propaganda that the world had ever seen. Our newspapers became prominently dominant. They didn't make much sense because they kept talking about battles which they didn't describe and didn't, couldn't describe because they were not describable in, in the amount of time needed in a page in the newspaper. But we were at the height, at the very height, and his preachments, which they were mainly, mainly, were very effective. The changes that he proposed was that all Europe would give up its remaining prominence and remaining strength, get out of Africa, get out of every other country that we became dominant and influential in reduce the United States to a country which is limited and also change the laws of labor and business and education and everything else according to the lines that we today call socialist. It was a new word then and it sounded awfully good. It sounded much, what's better than social help, social things and so forth. So. A new, a new country was being created here and a League of Nations would be created to settle the, all the issues of the world and there would never again be war. This was a war to end all wars. Can you imagine anything more brilliant than that? You go to war to end all wars? Well, it was believed. Unfortunately, his temperament was getting to be kind of di difficult to deal with in the sequence of discussions at Versailles. And Europe st still owed us money, didn't want to get into fights with him, wanted to get along, just get the war over with because it was a ruin. They had destroyed everything. Wilson didn't regard the founders as very learned because they hadn't gone to Princeton. And he did the talking. And he began to shout down any opposition. We, he had, of course, people in Congress who at that time had been elected fairly honestly and they didn't think they wanted to go along with his plan to change the rest of the world. He came back, he began to go on a speech tour to convince the population. And he had a, an attack. They raced him back home, got into the White House, they assured the people that he would be all right. His doctor assured everybody that there was nothing, nothing, uh, nothing serious, just a little rest and he'd be okay. And in page 68, the book 68 out of the numbers of books that I read was a footnote about his condition by a regular physician. They called his real doctor, or his acting doctor, and he proved to be absolutely paralyzed. Couldn't speak, couldn't move. The doctor said, nothing to worry about. He said, it's a, a very temporary thing. He's continuing to work at full ability and his secretary kept issuing statements that read just the same as they had before, and it seemed fine. His, his wife was very solicitous and very fierce, defending him against being interrupted. In the meantime, they had this very strange document which had been reached in Paris by which the world was supposed to be managed for a time. And a vote was 
supposed to be held in the United States as to whether we would set up and join the League of Nations amongst some of the other countries which would rule the world from a single new organization. And the press, of course, held this to be truth. Although Dr. Grayson didn't seem to know what to do and called a bunch of other physicians in to help him. Now, the Democratic Party knew that there was going to be an election in 18 months, which was not too long, but was a fair amount of time. And the question was, what happened to Mr. Wilson and when would he be back in shape to run the country? Well, the answer was that he had high state of intense pressure, blood pressure, which was inoperable and in nothing could be done. We have since discovered, medicine has since discovered the nature of that illness, which I guess we, we call it uh, high blood pressure. And he was in a state of complete collapse, reduced to the status, mental status of a small child. Could no longer think, could no longer speak, was in almost Waldo Emerson's condition, which happened to Emerson in his, at the end of his very long life. Emerson had reached the stage where he couldn't complete his sentence once he started it. Didn't know how to end it. Didn't know what he had said in the first few words. Forgot. Forgot each word as he pronounced it. Emerson, uh, Wilson was not in quite that shape, but he was uh, in, in the condition of a five, six, or seven-year-old child. And the doctor lied about it, and the others let him lie. And the, his, his assistant, his, his uh, secretary, who had a very high reputation for being honest and efficient and helpful, and who worshipped him, began to issue some papers and some conditions, some recommendations. And his wife, who had, a, had been to school for two years when she was a girl, who wrote in a large handwriting, would sign his name. And the Democratic Party, with all the thousands of employees that it had for the government, thought anything was better than losing the election before he had finished his term. They weren't going to give up all those thousands of jobs. And they, they said they visited him and he was fine. So no problem. So they told the country a lie, which was illegal. And that was the beginning of the long democratic reign over the United States in the 1900s. Because the writers built his reputation, had, had already built his reputation all the way to the top. And there was no way they were going to retreat. And you had a very skillful historian who wrote the major part of his biography, and all the rest followed faithfully what he said, because he had gone through thousands of letters and items to give it all the similitude of uh, the real thing. They, three people, the doctor, the secretary, and Mrs. Wilson, all lied and all occupied that great power, did their clumsiness with it at a time when 
all Europe was in a state of collapse and everybody, all those countries needed help and England was in a very bad shape and of course we had decided that we were much better than England, we had done better in the fighting well we didn't fight for quite a long time we did better in the bit that we used but we didn't come out as any heroes we lost an awful lot of troops because our officers had no experience with modern law the men were brave but the officers were not competent they weren't up to the level of World War I weaponry and, and certainly in the whole business of the battle that's not saying that they did very well they sent men into the path of machine guns for three years and they were wiped down as so many pieces of wheat and it took them three years to figure out that a man couldn't fight against a machine gun and nobody did anything to the English generals nobody knows why I think when I read about it I thought I was sorry that I didn't have a gun to shoot them too it was a terrible war it was badly fought it was insanely fought and it ruined a civilization they went ahead they began to build larger navies they didn't learn anything in the war larger navies larger everything and of course Hitler was alive and Hitler in seven years built a Germany that threatened all Europe in seven years total dictator the end of German civilization too of course we starved them for the first couple of years at, of the peace we wouldn't allow any food vessels to go in into Germany we wanted to punish them we're a great Christian nation that likes to punish people after we defeat them we're not sure that they understood that they were defeated put Germany to the to the wall they burned their cities with all the people in them alive they burned them we broke every rule that we had ever learned in all the years of civilization every rule every rule ending with a culminating bombs in the last two cities of Japan at a time when it was obviously defeated put General MacArthur in charge of Japan as a new Mikado you might say and began to have people give up the colonies that they had accomplished over a period of 500 years everywhere it took us 20 odd years I wrote a book about what they did in South Africa what the United States did it, at one point it demanded immediate payment of all the money that South Africa owed to the banks of New York with uh, they had never been in, in default but they had to give up that money and of course they had we had to see to it that the white people gave up the rule of South Africa we were, ran newsreels and newspapers and books about how the black had suffered under the whites in South Africa because of social discrimination although it employed more blacks than any other part of, of, of Africa it was the richest in, in Africa and now of course they're killing the whites that have remained and there's no news about that the newspapers have 
suddenly changed the whole business of telling the news. They don't tell the news anymore. There's no news in any paper in the country. There's discussions between the newsmen, and I know because I used to be one, and I, I don't read them anymore. I can't read them. I mean, I, I get uh, upset. I'm easily upset. <laughs> especially when I see nonsense being printed and discussed on television. I have to give up television. I, I don't like the, the lack of grammar, the lack of accent, the lack of common sense. This is a calamity. If you don't have a press and you don't have a population that reads books, you have an illiterate crowd. And illiteracy doesn't help civilization very well. I could say a great deal more about the illness that he had, because I did have here in previous copies descriptions of what the doctors said. The doctors finally, after 50 years, realized that what Wilson had was a variety of, of what am, amounted to small, you might say, dental, uh, mental hits in the brain. I mean, these little hits reduce intelligence and eventually took it all away from him in that period where that culminated in China, in, in, in Paris, at that great conference. The conference has never been, it's, it has been by some historians called the worst that was ever created. And it created a whole series of problems in all the colonies because if you teach people for hundreds of years how to do things a certain way and you send them to Oxford and you send them to Cambridge and you send them to Harvard they come out with these long wonderful ideas about how the world is supposed to be run, be managed and the fact that democracy does not work is still not penetrated the White House they're talking about it now in Iraq. Well, the way Iraq runs is how Hussein ran it. They didn't loot anything under Hussein. And he knew something about his people. At least he knew how to keep them quiet and behaved. We didn't pick, pick up the point. And we don't want to do that to uh, people. We don't want to have torture. But we're involved in torture now. We've picked up from Israel some of the methods of torture, which they apply in Palestine with our permission. We're in a very strange position to be the new emperor of the world because we have less knowledge of the culture of other countries than any great power. We really don't understand anyone outside our own, and we have trouble here, figuring out what's going on here. We don't quite understand how it is that we could have had a president like the one we got from Arkansas. And I'm sorry to say, therefore, that this is not exactly the kind of talk which even doctors like, because it doesn't do well for our, our medical profession. We're not pleased to hear that President Kennedy had multiple problems of medical nature, which the press never revealed, and he served until he was shot. I mean, he, he was very popular, very good looking, 
but he had a physician that had to be unlicensed after we discovered what he was doing to that president. And we are embarked on what is obviously a hope that we'll create a world empire at a time when we don't understand anybody but ourselves. And we're not making any effort to understand. We had not learned the lesson of World Wars I and World Wars II. The actual record is very difficult. I've just finished reading a book on the way we handle our money. And I'm not talking about banking and that sort of thing. I'm talking about how we tax and what sort of a tax structure we have and what our tax people do. They're a secret group. You can't get any, any information from them. But the taxes that they're putting on medicine, for instance, which they've encouraged the insurance company to tax, are atrocious. And medicine is one of the few areas where it used to be able to operate to the freedom of its profession. And it has the profession has no freedom today. It's, it's operating under the rules of the insurance people. And this is one of the reasons why this particular group is in existence, because it's badly needed. And what the politicians are doing is equally atrocious, because there is no limit to the behavior of the people the way it's developing. A very interesting writer wrote quite recently a book, or not a book, but a paper, entitled Christophobia in imitation of homophobia, which is used to criticize the gay people. And Christophobia, in his definition is the assumption which is now rampant that there is no answers in Christianity. Now we know of course that the Supreme Court believes that because it has effectively made Christianity illegal. Especially illegal in ed education because it poisons the minds of the children and teaches them things which aren't true. That's the excuse. But if you have a great civilization which has lost its belief in Christianity, we are confronted with no beliefs at all. And it was earlier said, if that's the case, then ev everything, is, everything is permitted. Nothing is denied. So that's been the result of the latest court ruling. It, everything is permitted, sexually speaking, and socially speaking. So if everything is permitted, you have no answers. And if you have no answers, you do not have a functioning civilization. And it went down the first time under the Greeks and the Romans in five years. And they had to flee the city of Rome and set up new cities and new towns throughout all Europe, which they did. But they had a church to help them, which gave them answers. Well, putting aside the question of whether the answers were valid, as long as they were believed, they were effective. And this great empires, all the great empires of Europe came into being. And the Europeans flood around the world. They led the world, the whole world, everywhere. 
and they had answers which they thought were sufficient. Well now they have Christophobia and they have no answers. And what do we do with no answers? As I hinted, we can't even make machines that work properly. We keep talking about it, but they're, the engineers that we're turning out are not as effective as their grandparents. Almost all the great advances that we made were made under our grandparents. Certainly my grandparents. And at great expense, my grandfather was one of the two men who found the oil in Venezuela in the jungle. They used horses to get in the jungle and the Indians taught, taught, pointed out where the oil was. They had to sleep in sleeping bags because, and with a machete and the machete was to kill the snakes between themselves and the horse when they got up in the morning. So it, it was a fairly impressive thing to do. And we had some he wound up in the Explorers Club, and he was very proud of that, in New York. We've done a lot of things in our history, of course, but not under organized education, which is turning out books, and turning out people who don't read books, unless they've been assigned a book by the boss. They can do that, but not on their own, and certainly not interpretively. So we are in a condition in much worse shape than our teachers have admitted, or for that matter, understand. And physicians are having a hard time because their skills are resented, as everybody's skills are now being resented. Resentment there is a book called Resentment which describes its effects upon the victim. It's a deadly illness. To resent the skills of others means that you think less of yourself and you're harmful to, to the others. And Mr. Wilson was expressing a resentment of aristocracy he didn't think that he, he didn't think that other people should be taught. He couldn't accept the inequities of in, the fact that nobody is equal. There is no such thing as equality. It's a myth. It sounds great, but nobody is equal to anybody else because we're all diverse. They're all different. And for the Democratic Party to establish itself by theft, by stealing the office of the presidency, was a great crime. And it continued with those crimes, following the socialist pattern that was established by Mr. Wilson to this day. I mean, he's very angry now, having lost an election via the the fact that the court intervened because they were going to continue to miscount the votes forever. They'd been doing it for every election prior to that, which was proven when Mr. Nixon was first defeated. Lyndon and John stole those two offices. It was well known. The press knew it. The press never exposed them. We relied on the press to get us into World War I, and we've relied on the press to get us the guy from Missouri. We relied it on, uh, to get Mr. Kennedy, who was unfortunately shot to death. And we hear now that he had every illness that you can think of. We didn't know it. <laughs> 
Why didn't they tell us? Well, of course, he'd have lost the election, which would have been a good thing for some women, not for everybody. And now that the press is falling apart, every episode, every area that teaches us information now, NBC, CBS, CNN, all of them, and all the newspapers are losing the audiences. Well, what are the audiences doing? Well, they're looking at Intergroup, which is, a, as I understand it, an avalanche of information and opinion with no particular pattern. And we consider this very, uh, very extended and, and, and very helpful. It's telling us things we didn't know about. But what are we doing? Well, homophobia, Christophobia, has been the result. And we have an incredible amount of information in terms of history. But we also have to realize that when we go into this history, we find that much of it has been altered for the worse. Very little of it can you pick and choose to find out what is accurate because there's no way you can check it. And the professors that we have, the historians that we have, are disgraceful. They sold out to the leaders of the, of the college that they're attached to. And they, they all have a body of, of uh, opinion which they have agreed upon. They agreed that Mr. Lincoln should have started a war. We saw 30 years before us the English dismiss slavery with a stroke of the pen. There was not a shot fired. They got rid of all their slaves, bingo, because they said it was not unchristian to have them. And the owners were given back the money that they had cost. And they were ordered to release the slaves after they taught them a skill so that they could earn a living and support their wives and children. We didn't give anything to them when we released them. Some fake efforts were done in the South, but in actuality we had, the white Southerners were left with four million blacks who had no skills, who were no longer being taken care of. And murders began, eventually. And there was some effort made in a sub Rosa kind of way to put them back by force. But we sent the army down to stop that. And we punished, punished them for having had slaves for the next whole century because we don't forgive very easily. This, this Christian country does not believe in forgiveness. So we, we like to hear about it. We like to get forgiven, but uh, we don't like to practice it very well. It's better now than it was. And there is some patriotism uh, obvious in the people. But not understanding the cultures of Asia and Middle Asia and Africa, not understanding any of these cultures presents a very heavy problem. And we're going to have to <clears throat> find out why we're not popular with the Europeans because we've done a lot of boasting through the years mostly undeserve it. And listening to Dr. Orient and reading, at least reading what is happening to medicine and to insurance and to wages and to economics, it's obvious that we better, if we don't want to look at the reasons for homophobia, we should at least consider
doing something about our lawyers, who shouldn't be lawyers of the court at the same time that they're looting the people. We should look at some of the examples that the original Constitution Convention discussed. We dropped our Constitution two years after it was in existence under John Marshall. Mr. Marshall was chief executive of the court, chief justice. He had broken a rule and denied it and was going to be impeached if the original Constitution was going to be applied, which gave Congress complete control of the country. The original control remained with Congress. The court decided that it could make that rule illegal on its own. And all the justices agreed to do that, which put the court in charge of the country. And Congress at that time upheld the court. So the court, having been one of the three branches that were running the whole country, and only, the, only a branch of the country, became the final word. And it fulfilled what Lord Acton described as a despotism. He was asked when he got angry at the Pope for passing an infallible rule over the faith. Up until then, the Catholic Church had free speech in, inside its own ranks for all those centuries. And the Pope said, from here on, when a rule is made, it'll be infallible and I will make the rule. And Lord Acton said that is despotism because when a person in authority passes an infallible rule, that is despotism. Now we have a court that passes rules which cannot be denied and cannot even be contradicted without a vote on its own opinion. We, could, we can kill all our kids. Perfectly legal. They're not quite grown, but that's not the point. The point is, it's the duty of the court, the duty of the court, duty of the government to protect all the lives of all the people. If it ceases to do that, we are living under a despotism. And that is one of the definitions which has come out of homophobia. Part of the answers that were provided by religion, which is not respected by the people. So if you don't, don't have a religion, and they have actually ruled that we don't have a religion, because a religion would be uh, too powerful, and not needed, science is disproving it, although every so often we discover that the lack of their proof is never definitive. If they keep finding new things all the time. So, without a religion, we're up against a religious group called Islam, which despise us. They're not going to become a democracy. They don't believe in votes. They have leaders who are both leaders and priests. They don't vote. Priests don't vote. At least not, not those priests. And the worst part of our difficulty is that we do not recognize our own history and we do not know what it is. Because our educational system is not honest. If you're not honest, how can you teach?
Now we know our historians are not honest. I should know, I've written a number of historical books. And every one begins with an examination of an error, like the previous speaker, <laughs> who was looking at the press and looking at false news. I would love to what he had to say, because he was taking them off. I don't know what my time is. Your time is up, my time is up. Well, I apologize for that. Thank you very much.